Hey, how are you guys? My name is Manuel Guevara Reyes. I'm hosting Guevara Reyes Talks. I'm talking to my close friend, Sadiqi. Um, if you could just introduce yourself and just we can get this started. All right. Uh, my name is Idris Sadiqi. I'm 22 years old from Palatine, Illinois. Very excited to be here today. Nice, bro. Nice. So, yeah, I brought you here today because... Um, we were just talking and it ended up like, oh, dude, like, you know, I knew you from the military and I was like, well, how's, how's life now? And now you're an EMT. So I thought that was very interesting that you were able to do that. So I just wanted you to talk about that. So um, I'll go ahead and ask you like the first question about it is um, how was your training for EMT and how long was it? Okay. Um, yeah. So once... Um... Once I got out, I, uh, I came back here and uh, initially, you know, I was going to college before I went in for fire, uh, firefighting. So, you know, I went back and, and spoke to my academic advisor and they told me that, you know, regardless of what I do, I'm going to have to get this EMT certification. And at, at that point, I'd never even heard of, you know, EMT. I had no idea what that is. Everybody knows who, you know, paramedic is, but EMTs. A level below that um yeah. so i i took it through harper which is a, a community college it was about three months although i know some people their class was about five or six months especially over covid a lot of things got delayed yeah. but in general it's anywhere from three to five months okay and what does emt stand for so there's there's different levels I'm an EMTB, which is an emergency medical technician basic. Okay. They also have AEMT, which is an EMT that's advanced. You can do a couple things like um, intraosseous drilling for IVs, which is in the bone. Um, but for the most part, there, from what I've seen, not many agencies um, use a EMTs, it's just EMT, and then you go to medical school. Okay, so for EMT, how you said how, you said it took you like three months. Yeah, so class was, uh, it was three days a week for about three hours. Sometimes we get out early, so I'd say two, two or three hours, three times a week. Um, and I was doing the night classes, so. The, the classes are actually in the hospital. Um, this, the, this hospital is partnered with this community college. So even though, you know, you pay tuition to the college, all of the classes are taught by a professor at the hospital. And you do all your, um, your hands-on training there as well. That's awesome. So what's, what's it been like for you um, like those three months during EMT training, like what was it like? What did you guys do? Like, what did you learn? What type What type of things did you go through? Or how, how, what's like the breakdown, you know? Because everything has like, I mean, I'm sure that there was like phases you had to go through, probably stages or like, mm -hmm. you know, like modules, we could say. Yeah, so I started in uh, the fall semester of 2019. Okay. So it's a, it's a nine credit class. There's three classes or I guess three courses that it's broken up into. Um, when you're going through the program, you don't really notice it, you know, cause you're just there for those, those three months. But if you look at it grade wise, you know, there's three classes, quote unquote. So, but in the beginning, you know, you go over anatomy and physiology. Now each uh, program, they do do it differently. Yeah. There's, you know, a national standard that everyone has to be brought up to. And there's various books that you can use. Um, my instructor, he, we jumped around in the book a lot because he, he's been doing it for, you know, 20 something odd years. So he has, you know, his, his way of organizing, I guess, that uh, made it it made a lot more sense for us. So we started with anatomy and physiology, which is basically, you know, your organs and body systems. Um, so that 
you can understand, you know, where things are in the body, because once you go deeper into things, you have to understand, you know, um, what's happening, what other organ systems it's going to affect and whatnot. So that's how we started. Most of it was lectures and we had uh, tests every week. And then I will say I was surprised by the, the grading scale. It's, uh, it's a, a lot harder than it was during uh, regular. I, I took some prereqs and I didn't take it seriously. So once I started in the, the EMT class, I was like, all right, I need to bring my GPA up. So I ended up studying about 40 hours a week for a nine credit class, which was way overkill. Yeah. But I was like, I'm, <laughs> I'm <laughs> definitely going to make sure, you know, I ended up getting a, a 4.0. So it's good. It brought my GPA up. Nice. But it's definitely, you know, just like when you're going through boot camp, it seems a lot tougher when you're going through it. But once you get out, it's like, oh, man, you know what? That was nothing. That was you nothing because the real stuff, the, the real stuff starts kicking in, huh? Yeah. Once you, you know, get out there on the street and then you're like, oh, shit, there's so many things that I didn't learn in class. You know, <laughs> it was just like with everything, you know, a lot of the knowledge that you're going to gain, especially dealing with people. Yeah. You learn that on the job, which okay. is unfortunate, but. Yeah. So this brings me on to my second question. So. From training to your first couple of weeks, how was it for you as an EMT? Like, what did you experience? Like, I'm sure you were nervous, excited. Like, what what was it like? So after, so I guess I, I graduated December 12th and I was fortunate enough to get a job about two weeks later um, once I got, you know, all the certificates in the mail. I immediately got a job. I've been working with a private ambulance company. Um, so with, as an EMT in a private ambulance company, you definitely don't do the job that, uh, <clears throat> that you thought you were going to do when you're in school. You know, we thought we're going to be, you know, dealing with people in, in car accidents or going through all these, you know, horrible things. Mm -hmm. And, working for a private ambulance company as an EMT it limits a lot of things that you, you can do because those calls are really reserved for fire departments or higher levels of care so initially it was a little bit of a surprise um, we end up taking a lot of people to their dialysis treatments which is you know very important for them that is yeah life and death for them and, you know, we take a lot of people to doctor's appointments and whatnot because they're not able to walk or they have some other, you know, monitoring that they need to be done by someone who has training. But every now and then you get some emergency calls. We get a lot of um, falls for nursing patients. And I will say in the beginning, I was, I was definitely nervous. You know, you want to make a good impression on people. And there's a lot of little things that you don't learn in school that you have to, you know, pick up on pretty quickly. I will say in the beginning, I, I did get in trouble a couple times. I won't say I, I got in trouble. I got reprimanded. Yeah. Because um, I didn't know what I was doing. And I, I did some things that in hindsight doesn't make any sense. But I thought, you know they were right. The first time I gave a radio report to a hospital, they thought <laughs> they accused me of not caring that I wasn't taking my job seriously and that I was drunk. They thought that I was slurring my words. What the heck? Because they, so they gave us a format, but then she started asking me all these questions about medications and whatnot. And you do learn some about medications, but especially being new and I haven't put that knowledge to use and mm -hmm. there's thousands of medications and I don't have them all memorized and know their uses. So I started stumbling through, 
you know, stuttering and, and I'm looking through the paperwork and I'm trying to ask her, is this what you're looking for and whatnot? So that hospital's very mad. They called the uh, medical control, which is like the, the medical system that's given me the license. And then they called my boss and then I got called into the office and I was <laughs> counseled. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Dang. Yeah, but after that, uh, you know, practice makes perfect, as with everything, yeah. and uh, definitely much better now. Okay. I was going to say, I mean, that's pretty traumatizing, man. Like, first couple of weeks, and, you know, you're over here trying to help people, and then they just want to freaking right. snitch on you. What the heck? <laughs> freaking snitches, man. Yeah. I'm trying to save your life. I'm kidding. I'm trying to help you out. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, how's it been after that? Like, you said it improves. Um what what have you used your knowledge for now like how how is it coming along so right now um i've been working at this specific it's been the same company it's been about a year and almost four months so i definitely have a lot more experience i'm one of the more senior emts there i've you know helped train probably six or seven people by now um so I, I i guess you know i have more of a educational role in in some aspects definitely with more inexperienced people they come and ask you guys or ask the older emts such as myself for advice on on how to do stuff and um patient care and whatnot but I, uh, I took a class that the company offers called, um, it's a ALS assist class. So what that basically enables me to do is work with medics. So, you know, I'm an EMT getting to work with a medic. And since I'm working with the paramedic, I get to see those, I don't want to say higher quality calls, but maybe the more severe patients, you know, who, uh, who are going through a, a more severe, intensive uh, medical problem. The gruesome so stuff. Have, yeah, I've been able to um, actually, you know, put some knowledge to use as well as learn, you know, more advanced things that they don't teach you in school from the medics, learn how to start IVs, spike bags, give some medications. Okay. Um, so stuff like that, that's what I've been doing for the last six or seven months. And it's absolutely wonderful. I was talking about another coworker of mine who she also, she works with medics a lot. And uh, we both said it's, you know, the, that rush, that adrenaline, you know, yeah. you're, you're doing what you thought you were actually going to do when you're in school. It's very addicting. And then you just yeah. want more and more, you know. Okay. That's good though. You're enjoying it, you know, and you're helping people out. So it's like a win-win. Right. Um, another question that I wanted you at, to ask you now that you, you know, you kind of just keep transitioning perfectly into it because <laughs> you, I was going to ask, how's the transition? Like, how can you progress? Like the EMT to paramedic, is it the easy switch? Can you like since right now you said that you have the ALS, you said you, you got that cert or you're like working with it. Uh -huh. um, you can, uh, e can you easily like, you know, transfer into a paramedic and just be a full blown paramedic or can you like, are you going to try to progress into it? Or are you just going to stay at EMT the whole time? There's definitely some people who, um, will become very comfortable in the EMT role. You know, it's not a very demanding job and the pay is not bad. You know, it's, it's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. definitely not where it should be, but it's, you get paid. You get um, paid. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's the numbers if you don't mind me asking? So right before I got hired, the city of Chicago passed some sort of ordinance where they were requiring um, businesses to start paying $15 an hour. Okay. So prior to me working there, they were getting paid around $13 and now we're getting paid 15. 
Okay. And that's just for an entry level EMT. It if you have you know prior experience and whatnot, they can uh, they'll definitely pay more. It's you know a sliding scale. Some people get 16, 17. I've heard of people you know who've worked for a couple of years are getting nineteen dollars. Nice. But for entry level EMT, fifteen. For entry level medic is twenty. And then if you go CCT, which is a higher um, training you can do as a medic, that's twenty four. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. All right. So yeah. So are, what are you, you planning on staying comfortable and just staying as a EMT or do you plan on progressing? Yeah, absolutely not. I, uh, <laughs> absolutely. I, I, I purposely work with medics as much as humanly possible so that I can learn, you know, as much as I can from them. I, I do believe that to a point I annoy them with all my questions, but I'm just trying to learn yeah. as much as I can. Um, I'm actually in the process of applying to a couple of medic programs. So hopefully this fall, if I get into them, because it's very competitive, I'll, yeah. I'll start medic school. And then once I finish medic school, then I'm going to go do nursing. You know, there's a lot of opportunities out there. If you become a medic or a nurse, there's a great many things that you can do. So I'm, I'm just trying to prepare myself for that. Uh, next step great. that's great yeah. i like that i like that you know um you know saturate them with questions you know all, Absolutely. what's the worst what's the worst they're gonna do say i, I don't want to talk to you anymore like okay <laughs> like i'm just trying, <laughs> just trying to learn you know i'm right. trying to get all the knowledge i can so that i can mm -hmm. progress you know i'm trying to be in your shoes do a better job help people out so that's great though that you're trying to progress i really like that um yeah so so about how long does it take um, from your point, do you think, how long would it take if this fall, everything falls as you want, you you beat the competition, which I'm sure you will. You got it, bro. I know you do. Um, <laughs> you. Um, it, you beat the competition. How long before you become a paramedic? So you've already been, you know, working as an EMT. It took you three months. And now you've been working for about a year and four months. Mm -hmm. About how long do you think it'll take for you to possibly be a paramedic or, or start nursing? So... Um... So the, the application process for a medic is a little, uh, there's a lot to do, right? So you, you have a lot of paperwork that you have to turn in with all your certs to make sure that everything's up to date. You have to get letters of recommendation. And then you turn in your application. There's an interview process. There's a written test. Then there's two um in-person exams that you have to do one is a medical trauma or one is a medical assessment and one is a trauma assessment so that they can see your skills so you know incorporating all of that into a package and then you're applying to a program that has 20 to 25 seats and there's usually 60 to 80 people applying you know for each one of those programs so if you get in it's very intense schooling most places are three days per week some of them are five yeah and you're usually going to be in school from like nine o'clock to 3 p.m something like that but if i start this fall it's 10 months of um in class training and that includes learning skills and whatnot and then depending on where your program is, you'll have an internship with either a private ambulance company or with a fire department. Okay. So the programs that I'm trying to get into, they all have an internship with a fire department so that I could hopefully, because fire departments definitely see a lot of, you know, those 911 emergencies and a lot more trauma. They'll see you know, gunshot wounds and stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, more interesting calls that on the private side, you're not really going to see. And since I already work for a private with medics, I'm already seeing a lot of those calls that you would see in those other programs. Okay. So in total, 10 months to about uh, 12 months. That's okay. just for medic. And then nursing is about two years. 
yeah my cousin's doing nursing you know she's 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 almost there she's almost there she's stressing out though like she's like it's stressful i hate it like uh but she's like well i passed this test so i have to pass the other one like she's right Might she's as well excited about it forward. Yeah. yep that's it yeah she she's loving it um dang that's pretty good though honestly i think that that's a really good time you know i mean mm. uh wait how long how much of your degree have you done if you don't mind me asking. So I, I started getting a uh, fire science degree back in like 2017, right after high school. And uh, I only completed half of that. And then I dropped out to enlist. And then I ended up getting out a little bit early. You know, so. <laughs> no, I know the story. No worries. <laughs> um, so now... I, I actually have an appointment on Monday to talk to an academic advisor who specializes in like uh, nursing and, and medical advising. Yeah. And I got to figure out because now now I'm changing, you know, to uh, I guess they told me it'd be a nursing degree, but I can't change it until I'm into the nursing program. So right now it's an associates of arts. And there's some, you know, humanities classes and whatnot that I have to take in order to, uh, to get the, the degree. Yeah. But as far as like classes that I need to take, you know, for my career, I already have my, my EMT. I have all my national certifications. So once I become uh, a medic, I just have to take some of those other gen eds and other really not very pertinent classes that they just want you to take. And then I'll have a degree. Nice. Nice question for you that I totally forgot to ask sure. um, during those 10 months, how much is like the medic school? Like how much does it cost to go to it? Like the tuition? So, for it? I've seen it's, it's fairly affordable. I've seen, as low as thirty five hundred up to six thousand dollars. Okay. And, and that, that's is, in total for the ten months? Yeah. Oh nice. Yeah. And with paramedics, it's really, you know, the, the amount of knowledge that you're getting is pretty comparable to nursing. It's technically supposed to be a uh, a two year course, but they condense it into one year so it's very intense yeah so if you're able to you know get through medic you should be able to basically do anything that you want because you're doing <laughs> two years course in one year yeah yeah you're doing crunch a hey, that's how it is you know sometimes you just got to crunch it get it done Absolutely. it's it's so much better it's a lot you know it's saturated and it's like very mm -hmm. heavy in knowledge but once you're done you know like you said most of the time with experience, you know, with the job, on the job training, it really is, it really is like that. Like you can go to nursing school, you can read all the books, you can figure it yeah. out two years, 10 months, but mm -hmm. being there in real life is very different, you know, and you're going to be Absolutely. dealing with specific things. So yeah, it makes sense. Make It's better, I guess, to condense because you could always look back and learn more, you know? Right, um, but but the experience part you just have to experience. The experience like, is much much better. Yeah, you have to know what you're talking about, and you have to you know be able to understand. But there's a lot of people that I've met; they're very book smart, but for whatever reason, you know, it just doesn't click. It doesn't. And you have to understand that with the patients, the sorts of patients that we're seeing, you know, the book's really a guideline. But just because the book says this should happen doesn't mean that that's going to happen. Yep. So you have to, the biggest, you know, quality that you can develop is learning to become adaptable. I, I've literally, you know, had situations where I've had to take out my knife and cut pieces of equipment and tape them together to jerry rig something so that this person could breathe because you know, what we had didn't fit the sort of connection that they needed or whatever the case may be. Yep. So you have to really be able to adapt and know and understand the human body so that you can know what you're talking about. Nice, nice. I like that.
adapt, adapt and overcome yeah. question mark. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead. Um, what was I going to say? Um, if you don't mind me asking this, sure. uh, hopefully it's not, it's something you can talk about. Um, what are your top three, like craziest experience as an EMT with a paramedic or just in general? Top three or just top one, if you only, if you have one memory, like kind of gruesome, crazy, if, if any. Okay. Um, so let's see, I, I have three choices. <laughs> I'll do, I'll do a funny one. And then let's see, what's a traumatic one. I'll, I will refrain from telling the sad stories but I'll, I'll try and keep it a little lighthearted. all right okay, uh, that's fair so the the first one i guess i was working in the city this was closer to the south side and i will say i'm from the suburbs so i don't mo know very much about the city and whatnot but um it wasn't the best neighborhood and we were called to a nursing home for a, a patient who was very aggressive so we you know we get on scene and um, i've read some books about psychology and just to try and help deal with these sorts of patients because we do get yeah. these sorts of calls a lot and i have been able a couple times to you know successfully talk them into going to hospital or and calming down you know when they don't want to, but it doesn't always work. So this lady, she, um, not to be, I don't want to offend anyone or whatever, but I'm just going to yeah. paint this scene. So okay. we were towards the South side. There were most of the people that lived there, the staff and the residents included were African-American. And this lady was the only white lady that I, I saw at the entire establishment and she was a little racist which mm. made it <laughs> a lot harder for you know the establishment to provide her care um so she's about 500 pounds we walk into the room she's in the last bed by the window and she's got you know like three suitcases and just all these Victoria's Secret bags, all packed up. She looks like she's about to go on vacation. So we're trying to talk to her and she's already extremely irritated. She doesn't want to talk with us at all. And me and my partner are of a lighter complexion. I'm, I'm Mexican, so, you know, I have a little brown, but it's... Uh, I guess it wasn't enough for her to be angry about it because she didn't give either of us any problems. Um, but she, uh, she started threatening us and she started throwing bottles of shampoo and whatnot. So we had to call the police. Damn. And I, I was not very happy with, you know, how she was talking to people there. So in my mind, and to my partner, I said, I really hope one of these police officers is African-American. <laughs> Just, I want to see the look on her face when they come in. Yeah. And, you know, her being as disrespectful as she was to everybody, how is she going to act once the police get here? And, you know, so luckily. <laughs> luckily. <laughs> there was two cops. There was a white dude. And then there was a black female who came and i was like all right sweet you know we're gonna see if she's gonna act different with them or she's gonna act the same so the cops walk in and initially you know it's like when your parents walk in and you're in trouble you start acting all correct and she started <laughs> she was very pleasant and we we're talking to her and then she started getting upset and then she they eventually came out she started you know dropping the n-word again and uh i think she tried to refrain herself because there's an african-american cop there but i guess she couldn't help herself so damn we ended up uh having to drag her out put her on the cot she she had 
admitted later to she drank a fifth of tequila <laughs> before we what got the there. Fuck? Yeah. So Damn. that's why she claims she was being so rowdy because of that. Um, but that that call didn't end up being too eventful. It's just a little little bit funny. Little rowdy, huh? <laughs> little little bit rowdy. Yeah, yeah. Damn, that sucks, man. I hate you know, it's it's kind of ridiculous, you know, with the topic of racism, like uh, mm. you know, that's that's a rabbit hole I do not want to go into because that's some freaking you know, yeah. it's uh, yeah, just avoid that completely. It's not necessarily avoiding it, it's just like the awareness that sometimes some people they don't even know. Like mm-hmm. I feel like if you grow up your whole life looking at the screen at a TV and all you see is a dog biting a human Mm -hmm. and then you go outside and you see a dog, you're going to say, it's going to bite me. So a lot of people have that ingrained in their head that, you know, like their roots, they're so ingrained since a child, they don't, you know, they don't, you know, they don't just like, boom, I'm racist now. Like, I feel like they, they just like, it has to be from a young age. They hear the parents. It's just like a, a culture that they were around that just, it spits out, you know, and it's just so awful. Like I'm totally against that or whatnot, but yeah, crazy. That sucks. It makes our lives harder. Everybody's like, come on now. Come on now. Yeah. So for my second experience, um, I was fortunate enough to, work with a uh, a flight medic crew so me and my partner we had to drive to an airport on the tarmac to pick these people up from their uh, airplane and then we took them to um, a house in I guess it was more of the suburbs it was a nice house and um, the uh, the patient she was going to go to some rehab facility in Colorado she was having um, some bulimia issues and whatnot. And she's been hospitalized for it. And uh, I guess she's been to that establishment before. So we're, you know, we're there just to help transport the crew to and from the airport. And uh, so once we get to the house, we obviously, you know, they are wearing a flight suit i guess it's like a a jumpsuit looks like super baggy pajamas you know and they have all these bags of equipment that they have to bring with them so you know we start uh assessing the patient and whatnot and she was extremely frail um just super i think she weighed probably 70 pounds and she was in her 20s yeah um but it was very interesting seeing this flight crew i'd never you know had this experience before but they have all all this portable equipment that you'd find in hospitals but they just have a smaller version of it so you know we helped establish a line give her some fluids help stabilize her gave her some medications so she wouldn't be nauseous on the flight and then they started running her um her blood work and just a, a little little device probably the size of um you know one of those graphing calculators that you had in high school yeah it's five thousand dollars and they use that to do the uh the blood work so they can see all the values and know what medications to give her and what not to give her um so we help you know get the the patient stable we put them on the stretcher bring them to our ambulance and we, uh, we go back to the airport and uh, we helped them put it back on the, uh, the airplane. And that was, that was probably the, one of the cooler experiences that I've had. That day I ended up working with about three flight crews and to see that the opportunity that, you know, paramedicine and nursing provides to you, you can be able to you know, work for these companies, they work two weeks on, two weeks off, and they fly all around the country, wow. you know, from, yeah, from state to state, they they just came from New York to Chicago, and then 
they're going to Colorado, and then they're going to Texas after that, you know, so to be able to m meet those peoples and, and see the sort of experiences that you can get in the future is definitely a little eye-opening and, and motivating for me and That's awesome. my partner That's as cool. well. Yeah, That's we talk awesome. about it all the time now. You're like, hey, you know, once we're medics, let's go try and do that because that was just really cool. You, They're flying on a private plane. You know, yep. it's just uh, uh, the nurse, the medic, and then they have two pilots. And you're just there with the patient flying over, you know, the Rocky Mountains, getting this, this person to where they need to go nice nice yeah. that's great that's great to hear thank you thank you for sharing bro do you yeah. have one you got one more or no yeah so um i don't, I don't know how i want to label this one but uh, just to to give people an experience of you know what uh what we have to go through as you know members in a community trying to serve we uh, we were dispatched to um, a hospital in the city that specializes with vent patients, which means for whatever reason, they've had to have a, a tracheostomy because they can't breathe for themselves. And now they're on a, a vent, which is just a machine that breathes for them, really. So me and my partner were dispatched to go help this paramedic crew because we can't run that, those sorts of machines. So this guy was 800 pounds and we had to take him to a two-story house in the city where um, he's going to live with his brother. And obviously him being 800 pounds, there's a lot of concern about how we were going to move him, especially since he was on a van, uh, Event, event, yeah, and the connection to the machine is just a piece of plastic tubing that's maybe maybe two or three feet long, and it's it's a little flexible, but you know it's very finicky, and it can come off very easily. And without that, he can't breathe, and he'll die. So we're very concerned. You know, we have to carry this guy up the stairs while maintaining this vent, you know, positioning, make sure that it's attached. So we got to the house and there's a, a total of eight of us. Um, so we, uh, we put them on a, a heavy duty tarp. And when you go through school and if you talk to people who work in the industry, they won't say it to the patient's face, but we call those tarps whale tarps because. Oh, wow. We're funny like that, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah. Some dark humor, well, bro. Some dark humor. <laughs> <laughs> right. You, you got to be able to live with the situation. So we put them yeah. on our whale tarp, which was, it, and it was a, a heavy duty, like reinforced one, you know, it was big, very thick uh, tarp. And there's seven of, seven of us, and we're trying to figure out how are we going to get this guy up? There was five flights of stairs, and, you know, we have to turn him on the landing. And it's in Chicago, so the, you know, stairways are pretty narrow. You could probably walk two people shoulder to shoulder. So we're, we're trying to figure out. How are we going to get this guy? Because he's about as wide as two people, if not more. Yeah. And we have to carry him up. So I had an idea. Let's put some backboards on the stairs and maybe we can slide him up. You know, I was thinking we'll just do it like they built the pyramids. You know, we'll, we'll just try to slide him up. And it kind of worked for the first two flights. Um, not really <laughs> because the problem was we'd get them up halfway yeah and you know since it's a slick plastic board he would start sliding down yeah and at point he was, right he was sliding out of the tarp too so whoever was on the bottom had to hold up 
his lower half, which is no easy feat because <laughs> he was a very heavy man. Yeah. So we had two people in the front by the head and the shoulders that were pulling. We tried to have two people on the sides, but due to, you know, the restriction that we had with him being so wide, it, it was really like one person on the side switching off and they were just <laughs> kind of making sure, you know, that he's not slipping out of the tarp. Yeah. And then we had two people on the bottom, you know, with his feet and they would just be pushing. So about halfway through, um, me and a medic are at the top and we're pulling, you know, as hard as we can to try to get this guy up. And we hear this big rip and the handle that I was holding just comes very loose. So we tore that tarp in half. There was just a clean break halfway through the tarp. <laughs> and wow. that is the only tarp that we have yeah, you know, yeah, for it's... someone that big. Uh-huh. So there was nothing we could do. We we still had to use it. <laughs> <laughs> Dang man. At this point, this was this was last summer. So it was about 80 degrees. You know, we're required to wear boots, long pants, as well as undershirt and then our, our work shirt. So we're all sweating profusely. And uh I felt very bad for this man because we were, you know, we're dripping sweat. We're panting, trying to catch our breath, and we're just dripping sweat right onto his face. And we're like, oh, I'm, my God. Like, I'm, I'm so sweating, sorry. bro. I'm sweating right. just listening to this, like, 80 degrees, man. Was, Fuck that. <laughs> we started, you know, taking off layers, and, you know, we just had our undershirts on because it was – I mean, we were drenched, you know. This is, was a lot of effort. And eventually, after much effort, we finally get him to the top and, you know, this was a brand new house. So there's no furniture or anything wide open spaces. It was great. So we were thinking, okay, this dude's 800 pounds. They'll probably have a bed set up in the living room because that's what most families do. You know, they have to be able to, to easily maneuver around and whatnot. And the living room's just the best place for that. Yeah. The, uh, the brother apparently did not agree. So he had his own bedroom that we're supposed to bring him in. And the hallway that we're supposed to go through was narrower than the staircase that we just came up. Jeez. And then we had to take a sharp turn into the room. So what we did was, and I, I'm sure this isn't the best way to do it, but this is really all we could do at the time. We just laid him on his side and kind of just hooked him around and you know he got in he got in bro that's, he got that's in the job he got that's in bro all we could do we we just slid him on the ground and then the the best part he has a uh, a hospital bed which is great you know they they rise up and down you can adjust it but they sit probably 6 to eight inches off the ground and there's no way to make it all the way on the floor so we had to get this dude there's six of us there was or seven of us there was three girls and four guys we had to pick up this 800 pound man just eight inches off the ground onto this bed and that was definitely the hardest part for sure yeah bro I bet <laughs> each i mean even if you split it by seven a hundred by seven that's mm -hmm. only 700, 700 pounds. This man's 800 pounds. Y'all are, are at least all lifting at least 120, 130 each. Right. Rip. The positioning it was not, you know, if it was at the gym and you just got to lift, you know, 150 pounds, fine. But this is a, a living person. The weight distribution is not the same. And especially him being as wide as he was. You know, he just kind of wobbled a lot. <laughs> uh, I, I guess that's the best word that I can, I can come up with it. But uh, yeah, I almost, it, it was on accident. I wasn't thinking we were just, you know, trying to, uh, to get him on the bed. But it was me and my partner. We were pulling because we were the two, we were the strongest and youngest ones there. And everyone else 
you know, was on the other side and they were going to help push him onto the bed and we were just going to pull him up. So it's just me and him. We're literally standing on the bed so we can get some leverage and we start pulling. And um, I don't know, you know, if your listeners lift weights or whatnot, but <laughs> when you're, when you're pulling something, you, you need a brace sometimes, you know, imagine you're doing like a, a dumbbell row at the gym, you put your hand on the bench yep. and that was basically the position that we were in. So initially I had both of my hands on the tarp and I, I was not bracing myself against anything. So I was like, oh shit, I need something to push against so that I can pull harder. So without thinking, I just reached out and found my partner. <laughs> and I, I pushed on him so that I could pull on the tarp and end up like pushing his arm deep under the tarp. And I almost made him fall under the guy. Oh, yikes. And, uh, yeah, it was, I, I apologize profusely afterward. You know, <laughs> he wasn't mad about it. He understood. We were just desperate to get this guy onto the bed and you know afterwards the uh there was a, a respiratory therapist there and he said that was you know the best teamwork that i've ever seen like, uh, yeah. you know, it, it was very coordinated we all knew each other so we worked very well together yeah, but that's good that makes it work even better dude that flow that you know y'all were yeah. morale was up cohesion <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> you know yeah. We were outside, you know, we had our, our shirts off and whatnot. We took like a, a group selfie. Nobody touched each other though, because we we're all like sweaty and hot and sticky. So we all, this was before the social distancing, but it was, you know, it was funny. It was great. And then we Bro, had some. If I can together. see that picture, I will love to see it. I need to yeah. see that, bro. I'll, I need to see it. I don't have it. So I'll, I'll text some people and um, see. All right. If they can send it. send it to me but yeah i can send it over how long was that that whole freaking uh i don't even know what to call this process uh, experience ex <laughs> yeah how long was it man probably an hour and a half maybe two hours damn that was a work that was literally a workout we, we it was call workout. It the well tarp workout yeah, <laughs> yeah it, was, uh, it was good times good times yeah. Yeah, like I said, man, thank you for sharing. That's really great. I appreciate it. You know, I enjoy your perspective and that's great. I'm glad you were able to share what you were to share. And I just wanted to thank you for that because, you know, you have no reason to share this with me, you know, just, you know, this just, you know, I have to brag to somebody. You know? <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh, man. Well, um, do you have anything, any questions for me, bro? Anything? Um. Well, I mean, I can, I can ask you some personal stuff once we get off here, but how uh, I'm looking in, into uh, starting the podcast stuff myself. Yeah, yeah. How would you recommend, you know, getting it started? Um, it's pretty easy, actually. I could definitely, you know what? I'm going to wrap it up and then we can talk after <laughs> for sure. All right. Yeah. Um, well, that. thank you again for coming on the show and... Thank you for having me. Yeah. This was very fun. This is my first podcast. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Adria Siddiqui, it's my boy. Um, I hope you guys enjoy this podcast and his EMT experience. And again, thank you. And yeah, that'll conclude it.